So welcome back to the channel. In this episode of Thought Talks, we're going to be talking about the Enlightenment, thinkers like David Hume and Rene Descartes, and a big topic that they would think and talk about is the mind-body relationship. But more importantly, we're going to be talking about habits and how habits are formed and what that kind of dictates for our character. Uh, the whole video is going to be basically me going through the kind of history and philosophy and arguments of it, but stick around to the end where we can kind of get practical advice on how to build habits and how we even take away habits and how to build our character through habits. So as I already said, we're going to be talking about habits, but more specifically, we're going to be talking about the double law of habits. And the double law of habits is essentially uh, when you first do something, you have no kind of memory of how to do it. So it's very difficult for you. And there's a huge emotional response. So kind of like a flight or fight kind of response to something. Uh, and you guys kind of know it's the first time you do something, you're very nervous and you don't really know how to do it. You don't do it very well. But as you repeatedly do something, that emotional response gets lower and lower uh, and your memory of it improves. So you get better at it and you have less of a reaction to it. Our soul, insofar as it is a substance which is distinct from the body, is known to us merely through the fact that it thinks. The other functions which some people attribute to the soul, such as moving the heart and arteries, digesting the food in the stomach, and so on, do not involve any thought. They are simply bodily movements. So this is uh, Rene Descartes and his description of the human body, and Descartes essentially arguing that self-preservation can take place without the mind or the soul. Uh, and he, he uses those interchangeably, the mind and the soul, so they mean the same thing. Uh, these sort of things can be done without a mind or a soul, and the mind and soul only deals with conscious thought. So anything that you are immediately conscious of, that is the mind and the soul. Anything that you're not immediately conscious of, that is not. So he gives this example to make this distinction when you have a friend and he's uh, pretends to hit you and you know he's not going to hit you you know he's his friend your friend uh, you're conscious of this yet your body still reacts your body still has this kind of muscular contraction of wanting to preserve itself and you can't really control this unless you repeatedly expose yourself and you really just know but I mean, even then you kind of just still have this flinch and this is what he means it's like you have this reaction to something to self-preserve even though your conscious thought is that he's not going to hit you so they're always in opposition to one another so Descartes did not believe that all reactions oppose conscious thoughts, such as eye blinking. If I use a, th a conscious thought, I can stop my eyes from blinking, even though it's usually an unconscious action, just like I uh, can, can do it right there. But usually, you know, you can just keep your eyes open if you have a conscious thought of doing this. And Descartes also had this idea of, you know, he relates this to childhood memories, childhood habits, so things that you... You, you did as a child that kind of have carried over into adulthood, you can use your conscious rational thought to counter that and to reverse it and do something else. So the physiologist Herman Borhave, who was born in 1668, concluded the same thing as Descartes. Uh, and he kind of made this distinction of two machines in the body. So the animal part, which is also known as the mental part, which is controlled by the higher brain and nerves connected with voluntary muscles. And the second part is connected to the cerebellum. This is called the vital machine, which controls involuntary systems like the digestive system and circulatory system. So these things are necessary for survival. So Borhave's conclusion is that, you know, without a will or a conscious thought, you cannot do voluntary movement. So if you're laying on your bed um, and you want to do a voluntary movement, you need a conscious thought or a will to do that. Um, and this distinction kind of falls apart when you think of an activity like walking or it could be any other activity. You know, as you start walking, you have a conscious thought of doing that. But say you're talking to a friend, you kind of lose your conscious thought of doing it. Your body just kind of does it. Uh, it's kind of like an autopilot. So that's where that distinction kind of falls apart and you have to try to look at it from a different angle. So Aristotle concluded that moral or virtuous action is a consequence of habit, and Joseph Butler believes the same thing in his book Analogy of Religion, which he wrote in 1736, but he goes even one step further. Butler argues that passion decreases, but proficiency increases. So what he means by this is when you're doing an action, uh, when you first do it, you have this kind of passion that he calls it, um, but you're not very good at it. Uh, but as you keep doing it, you get better at it and that passion goes away. And some of the reason you get better at it is because the passion goes away. Because oftentimes you're doing an activity and your mind is just filled with, with anxiety or, or fear or adrenaline or whatever. You can't rationally think and focus on how can I do this the best way possible. Uh, so as you continue that action, that goes away, which gives you clearer thinking. For example, if you go to a country with a lot of suffering, you're overwhelmed with passion of pity and empathy, and this passion gets in the way of your rational thought to actually help. Um, a lot of people are like this, that they feel a lot of empathy and pity, yet they do nothing. Uh, but as you are constantly exposed to this feeling, 
uh, the passion associated with empathy and pity ceases. Uh, and if you do decide to help, as, and as you keep helping, uh, the pity and the empathy subsides, and those qualities are now built into you. It's now part of your character. The passion makes way for rational thought on top of your built-in empathy and pity to help with more ease and efficiency. So a lot of people, they kind of they kind of look at something or they see something and and they're just filled with this emotion and, and whatever, but they, they never rationally, logically think of a way to help. And oftentimes, even though they have good intentions, the first time you go to help someone, you're just so overwhelmed with this emotion that you can't help. But as you keep practicing this keep experiencing this this virtue of empathy and you associate helpful actions with that that passion goes away and it's just something that's it's just now a part of you and now that empathy and pity just is like on autopilot and you can rationally think of actions that can actually help so the philosopher david hume comes to the same conclusion as this and this conclusion is very important with how we construct habits with almost all things not only just um virtues so new actions presented to the soul give resistance to the animal spirits, causing them to be agitated. So agitation increases whatever emotion is associated with this resistance. But as we expose this resistance, the agitation decreases. So basically what he's just saying is when you're presenting with a new action, you have this resistance. So if you're doing an assignment or you're doing something for work or you go to try to learn a new sport, there's a lot of resistance to doing it. Maybe it's laziness, maybe it's you know fear, maybe it's any of those things. But as you keep doing it, the agitation decreases and the resistance decreases. So once those things decrease, the novelty wears off and we actually derive a source of pleasure still from its orderliness and lack of resistance. So for example, you being able to clean your room with ease because the resistance your mind originally gave has worn off with the novelty. However, the facility of habit as described above, if it becomes too great, makes us indifferent to the task. In other words, we get bored. Hume asserted that violent passions, when we do something for the first time, in other words, can be overtaken by calm passions, no resistance, and this is important to build moral character. So essentially, David Hume's arguing that there needs to be a, a, it's a very careful balance. You have to be careful not to tip. You want to get good at something. You want to repeatedly do something as a habit to get so good at it that you can kind of just do it unconsciously and there's no resistance to it. If I get so used to something, it's just like my body wants to do it. I no longer have to really struggle to do it. But you also want to be careful when you get into these habits and the novelty is really worn off, um, you, you lose so much. You get indifferent to it. Your body's just like, this is just too much of a chore anymore. There's no excitement. There is there's zero excitement. Even the calm passion, as he says, of me getting no resistance, it's being overshadowed by my boredom. So an example of this, um, it's actually in the paper, uh, is partying. You know, as you party more, the novelty wears off, but there's this kind of pleasure you, you receive from performing well at a party. And yes, you can perform well at a party. This means, you know, you're relaxed, you understand the flow of conversation, etc. A lot of people can't do this. Uh, whereas the first time you're, you, you go to a party and you interact with people, you're using all your conscious thought to keep that person engaged. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this. When you're not very good at speaking with people, especially the first time you talk to people, you're just thinking, what is the next thing I'm going to say? What am I going to say next? What if they get bored? You have all this conscious thought in you. But as you keep, that's what they say, keep, talk to a lot of people get good at it. it takes practice because then your mind just kind of just goes on autopilot so a funny thing that i think happens to all of us is when we're in a conversation uh something kind of happens and we could have said something but we only realize this a few hours later so for example you say why didn't i say that when i had the chance why am i thinking of it now and that's mostly probably because you were so overwhelmed with conscious thought and emotion you couldn't rationally think whereas if you're rationally thinking and you were relaxed your brain probably would have came up, come up with it. Your brain only came up with that response later when you're away from that person because all the stress is gone. So we want to be good at talking to people. We want to derive pleasure from this. We want to be good at, I can really work a party. I can work a crowd. But if the party becomes too embedded as a routine, uh, the boredom overshadows the pleasure of the routine. You just get bored. So I've had my share of parties and, you know, it's fun in the, in the beginning. It's very kind of exciting. And you get good at partying. You get good at like talking to people and, and, be, and conversing and doing things like that. But eventually, you know, it's the same questions. What year are you? What is your major? What are you studying? Oh, what do you want to do with that? Oh, where do you want to move? What kind of things do you like? What do you do for fun? And you just keep running into these same conversations that soon it's like, okay, I kind of know how this goes. I know what responses to give, but it's getting so boring. So for this to get more exciting, someone would have to throw me a curveball. For example, they could say, what is your opinion on the Enlightenment, David Hume, talking about habits? You know, then it's like, oh, 
this is new. I've never seen this before. I have a new emotional response set now. And now I can kind of think about it and be like, wow, okay, I'm kind of pressed with this question. So physiologists toward the end of the Enlightenment end up disagreeing with Descartes' idea of mental processes having to be conscious, but everything after that still stands, and I know we kind of want to cut to the end here and get to like the practical advice, So because there's a lot of physiolog physiologist idea on this stuff, but it's just too much to put in one video. If you guys want to see a second part of this, we can do that, but we'll get right into the practical kind of evidence. So when we're wanting to create a new habit, you have to focus on that one habit. If something is not yet a faculty of the mind, it needs a lot of brain power to run. So if you're focusing on building several habits at once, your mind will just throw in the towel. So for example, my first time ice skating, I used all of my conscious thought to keep my legs upright as I'm doing it. Um, there was no thinking of the meeting happening in a few days. There's no thinking of, oh, what I want to eat for dinner. All of my thought and brain power is on skating. But as I do it repeatedly, my mind is able to kind of put this as a faculty. It becomes part of me, part of my mental process. I have a memory of it. And that emotional response goes away. My body expects it to happen. So now as I'm ice skating, I can think of anything I want. The second thing you want to consider when wanting to build a habit is you have to be prepared for resistance, but expect the resistance to dissolve. So many disciplined and successful people say, you know, I get up at 6.45 in the morning, you know, I do this, but it's discipline, it's not motivation. You just have to do it, you just have to do it. And that's true, you have to do it. When you want to start a new habit to become successful at something, you have to start and you have to just kind of just do it for a while. But what they fail to say is that resistance you feel, well, first of all, that resistance will become less over time, but you will reach a point where that resistance is completely gone. There will come a point where you do any like 10 pages of reading a day to where your body just almost naturally needs it. It's so expected that there's no more resistance to it. And you, ha you have to understand that conclusion of your practices because while you're practicing this new habit and you're facing all this resistance, you're like, dang, man, I'm not gonna be able to do this for my, the rest of my life. Look at how much resistance I have. But you have to realize that soon you will reach a point to where it's so embedded into you that there will be no resistance anymore. So now you've kind of done these things multiple times. You have your habits and you're enjoying the feeling of ease while doing these things. But do not construct your day full of habits. This is how pleasure of ease gets overshadowed by the faculty becoming too great. So your mind just becomes indifferent. When you have habits, don't make your whole day a routine. Don't make your whole day a big habit because your day is the same thing over and over again. This can be seen with like weightlifting, for example. People stick to the same weightlifting routines for six months to a year. And they just get burnt out and they just don't want to do it anymore. Even if you have the best exercises, it might be best to just switch them up. So then you have more of a motivation to do it because then, you know, you can have the best exercises, but if you get burnt out and your body doesn't want to do it anymore, you're not going to get bigger, you're not going to get stronger. You need to give your body the kind of excitement it needs to to keep working out and to keep exercising. So I hope you enjoyed the video. This is the Enlightenment's thinkers on it, on habits. If you have any questions, if I wasn't clear on something, uh, leave it in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think. How do you guys form habits? Do you think it's true that, you know, we have to just keep pressing on it and soon resistance goes away? What about the mind-body problem? There's tons of things to, to answer here, so I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are. If you're new here, I'd appreciate if you subscribed. Uh, leave a like if you enjoyed and comment, and thank you for watching.